Welcome to another edition of Common Thoughts of Christ. Early in the morning, this is the series called <laughs> Little Thoughts of Christ, Special Thoughts of Christ in the Morning. I got my Bible open, I have my coffee here. I hope you're able to take a quiet time and be with the Lord directly in these quiet times. I'm recording this in the springtime. And the springtime is a beautiful time when the sun gets up a little earlier and it gets me up as well. And I've noticed as I grow older why, you know, the Lord is able to maybe clean the hard drive during the night. And uh, I wake up with thoughts of him, and I hope that you're able to do the same as well. Of course, I will say sleep is a beautiful thing. Sleep is a, is a gift from God. And if you're if you're having a difficult time sleeping, may... May the Lord get grant rest for the body, right? Rest for the body. But it's a, a beautiful thing as we take up now the um, first uh, chapter of Ezra. Last time we took up uh, Cyrus, we took about his his heart being moved, right? And uh, we saw the condition of the people, what got them into where they are today. In our portion here, they were given over to idolatry, and God had carried them off. And they were to rest. The land was to rest for 70 years, and they were to get spanked out their idolatry. And so as they come back, they don't have idolatry any longer. It's a beautiful thing to see how God has to take us through some times and allow us to um, find out more about him and take away some things that are needed to be taken away. And so now we're into the second half of chapter 1, Ezra chapter 1, and I want to go ahead and read that. We find here in verse 5, Then rose up the chief of the office, uh, fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Methredath the treasure, and numbered them unto Sheshbar and prince, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty chargers of gold, or thirty chests of gold, a thousand chargers of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. And the vessels of gold and silver were five thousand and four hundred. All these did Sheshabar bring up with them out of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Well, it's interesting to see in verse five, we were looking at hearts moving, right? God is into hearts. He's into fixing hearts. He's into moving hearts. And we find here that the hearts of the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, the Spirit of God comes through and moves their heart. Isn't that beautiful? I just, I, you know, you can look back into history if you're, if you like to see history and you see the Spirit of God moving, moving the hearts of men and women of God to particularly come to glorify Him. It's got to thrill his heart when there are willing vessels that say, yes, Lord. And I think of that verse, I being in the way the Lord led me. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And so here these ones are, spirit is being moved up. And, and we see here another company here, um, verse 6. We see It seems to be the neighbors and those who are around them in that day, in that land, strengthen them they weren't going up themselves it appears it looks like they were enabling them with all the goods that they would take with them back to the land and remember that land jerusalem was a big burnt rubble heap there was no altar there was no temple and there was no wall and that's god's center right there and yet there are we're going to find out here as we go along here there's 
close to close to 50,000 people. That sounds like a big number. Well, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at these two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, it's a very small number. It's a very small number that the Lord is moving to go back to his earthly center. And so it's nice to see these ones being being uh, exercised. You know, I'd like to jump back real quickly to the book of Psalms. And there's a, there's a section of Psalms here that, <clears throat> if you haven't studied this before, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I, when I say back, you have to have, actually have to move forward in the Bible. <laughs> but because I told last time, remember we looked at Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, your last two historical books of the Old Testament. But in the canon of Scripture, we move ahead to the book of Psalms and jump on down to Psalms 120. So this is going to be directly after that long psalm, the Psalm 119. Okay. And you're going to find, as you, if you get there, I'm still trying to turn my pages there, there is a little term at the top of those psalms called a song of degrees, okay? A song of degrees. And you can see some of them were, like in Psalm 122, it says, a song of degrees of David. And so <clears throat> as we go through, as you thumb through these psalms, you're going to see there's 15 of them starting at 120, okay? And it heads on over to um, the Psalm 134, okay? Now, why do I bring this section of Psalm 15 Psalms up? Well, it has been said that these Psalms were specifically arranged in such a manner for those that were coming up out of Babylon, for those coming up out, out of the captivity, and they were heading to God's center, this is a progressive nature of these songs of degrees. And so there's much meditation to have hither, just absolutely beautiful. You'll see there that uh, there's seven psalms before, and then there's a middle psalm, and there's seven psalms afterwards here, and there's a lot of different... Uh, uh, things and joys, things to say. But while we're here, while we're here, I'd like to read a few verses out of Psalm 126 because this presents us the nature for these people that were reading in Ezra, Ezra 1, verse 1. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. <laughs> There's the moving of the heart of the people, right? When, when the Lord reversed the captivity of Zion. So he's reversing the captivity. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. What does that mean? We just got done reading last time. A couple portions, God's, God's uh, scripture has shown us specifically that Cyrus was moved to send, to allow people to go back and to support them financially as well. So the Lord hath done great things for them among the heathen. Verse 3, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the desert. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Well, we're going to find out <clears throat> there are those in this company that are coming back that were little children as they left, as they left the land and they're being carried back into Babylon, right? And and they are going to be over 70 years old, obviously. And we're going to find out that they remembered the former glory. And here they are, we could say that there was tears that were leaving as they were being carried off in that day. Yes, they were given over to idolatry, but at the same time, I believe there were certainly dedicated people towards Jehovah of that day that were weeping as they got carried away to that land. But now, now there's going to be rejoicing, rejoicing. I go back to um, uh, verse uh, 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. There is a cycle. There is a cycle. I don't know about you, but I have been through a handful of times in my life where there has been a sowing of tears. For whatever reason it is, there's a sowing of tears. 
a time when they're just utter, utter, de- almost of the word depression, but crying for whatever the matter may be, personal or collective or whatever it may be. But it's nice to see that when that is all laid out before the Lord, when the work in my heart has been done, that perhaps I can get on the other side and, what does it say in verse 5, reap in joy. There is joy. Joy comes in the morning. And so if you're going through a dark, dark time right now, realize that the Lord is so gracious that he takes us through the valley of the shadow of death even, right? And we can come out on the other end and realize the Lord has been holding us but giving us a new perspective of things. You know, I share this personal story. It's been a story that's that's been with me for 30-some years, and I was 21 years old when my dad was taken from us with cancer after a one-year battle of cancer. And I was very, very distraught um, at that time to see at his young age of 48 that he was taken. And I can recount vividly the times of tears that I had at that time. But looking back and for other situations and times in my life, I can see that these times of tears have produced times of greater dependence upon our Lord. And that's what he wants. He takes us through these times. And he's taken these children of Israel through the children of Judah and Benjamin, to be exact. He's taken them through 70 years of captivity, of tears. And there is a time when they come back and their hearts are moved and they are rejoicing. Well, enough of that. There are those that help them in verse 6. But then I also wanted to bring up verse 7 and 8 of our chapter, Ezra 1. We have all these vessels coming back. And it's interesting to to see a couple things. Number one, God is keen on counting the vessels, right? He takes inventory of these vessels coming back. And I'd like to, we can look at these vessels actually in another couple spots. But let's go over to... If we look at the book of Daniel, right? So thumb back to the book of Daniel. Again, I mentioned Daniel quite a bit last time because of the fact that Daniel plays into this. Daniel might have been living at this time for whatever reason. He did not come back to God's center. But we find Daniel relating something here in the second verse, second verse of chapter 1. And I have to put on the right glasses to read. <laughs> I don't know if you have that problem, but I switch between glasses to read. Daniel 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and a part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, and to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. There we see a a transferring, a transferring of vessels that were wholly given over to Jehovah, and they were to be carried and put into the house of of um, Nebuchadnezzar at that time. Isn't that a solemn thing to think of these holy vessels that God were being used for the sacrifices for God in that day? And they were now going to be brought and put right into the temples of idolatry. And it has been said that, we're getting back to our first chapter of Ezra here, that these vessels that are being carried back, that have been taken away and then now carried back, can speak of us of truths, God's truths that have been lost at some time, right? And we can go back very, very quickly back to the Apostles' Doctrine. We can go back to the Epistles, okay? And we find very quickly in the, in the, in the ways of man when he holds on to these beautiful truths that 100 years after the Lord has gone back to glory, 200 years, 300 years after he's gone to glory, that these truths that the, that the Apostles have given to us in the Epistles are very soon lost, And that's a very evident thing. You can look into history and you can find out that the church of God gives up these truths. But then God in his ways lets 
1,500 years go by maybe, 1,400, 1,500 years go by, and eventually we start to see these truths start to be recovered. What do you mean by that? Well, in the 1,400s, 1,500s, 1,600s, et cetera, you see men of God recovering truths, truths like the grace of God as a means of salvation, not of works, but of grace of God. This is a truth that has been lost. There was other truths that had been lost as well. And as time goes on, we find more truths that are recovered, that have come back, that God has showed and his Holy Spirit has shown us. Namely, when you get down into the, the early part of the 1800s, you far, start to find truths such as the coming of Christ, his bride, as a bride for his people. The shout, behold, the shout goes forth. These things are being recovered later on down the road. They had been lost for a lot of time. The truth of the way in which we are together, the truth of which uh, of resurrection, uh, being raised from among the dead. All these things have been recovered in a later day. And so here we have these vessels being recovered and being brought back to the Jerusalem. Now, interesting enough, I thought it was an interesting thing at the end of verse 9 of our chapter here. We got 29 knives. <laughs> Do I know why there's 29 knives in the inventory? I don't know that. But you know something interesting as we go through here? Someday, someday, I, you know, when I meet Ezra, it'd be nice to ask Ezra, why did you include 29 knives there, right? It's a beautiful thing to see. Little hidden things here that I don't know why there's listed 29 knives, but there must be a reason as to why God would want that in the canon of the scripture. And then we come on down here to verse 11, that we have a complete transaction detailed out in verse 11, right? We have Sheshbar bringing up from them out of the captivity that brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. We have completeness. What God's work starts, he completes. Isn't that beautiful? When God's work starts, he completes it. These vessels make the trip. They are released from Babylon, and they head back to Jerusalem. A beautiful thing. And that's over 1,000 miles, right? 1,500 miles, somewhere in there. Is, there's a long, treacherous thing, but God's vessels, the vessels that were to serve him, came back directly back into Jerusalem, and he sees it all the way through. So it's a beautiful thing to see this, but there are some things that are not there are some things that are lost. What things got lost in that in God's economy of that day? What things did did, did the God's people have, and uh, earlier in that time that were lost? Well, the ark. Remember the ark. The ark was in the back of the holy of holies, right? Whether it was in the tabernacle in the wilderness or that it was in the temple, that was that <clears throat> box that had the mercy seat on top, and it had the cherubims looking down upon the gold sprinkled plate called the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled annually. Inside of it, the inside of the ark was the Ten Commandments. There was the bowl of manna. There was the rod that budded from Aaron. All that's gone. We have no account of it. We have no account of it. And so that had been lost. What else was lost? We had the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory was that cloud that covered the mercy seat that you find in the tabernacle. Later on, you find God bringing down that cloud and shows that he was dwelling amongst his people there when uh, when you read about Solomon. Remember when Solomon was dedicating the temple? You can look it up. It says that the cloud <laughs> it was so thick they couldn't even serve. Beautiful to see God's presence there. But the cloud of the Shekinah glory was now gone. And you can read about in Ezekiel concerning that, how it left. There is record of the Shekinah glory leaving. And lastly, we have the ermine and thumb, and you know the stones that were in the high, the chief priest, he, uh, uh, high priest that is, he was he interceded for the people and made decisions. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to help and direct them at that time, and so that was lost as well. So we do have some specific things that are lost, but in God's provisions for His people, there is also a there are things of recovery. There are things in recovery, and it's been noted. It has been noted when man is given responsibility for something, he oftentimes neglects the responsibility and ends up forsaking the things that God has given him. It's a solemn thing. But 
Good news is, by God's grace, and this is what we're seeing here, these vessels are being recovered. We're seeing these chief of the fathers here, their hearts are being worked on, and they're gathering up for those to go with them. And lastly, we see Cyrus, his heart was being worked on as well. It's just a beautiful thing to see such a magnificent movement going on, and many hearts were being moved, and many details are being accounted for here that were taken up in the first chapter of Ezra. So anyway, next time we'll take up Ezra 2, and I look forward to doing that as we plow through here together, and we seek to bring through these truths of where Christ might be, where this can impact my walk, and so hoping that a few meditations this morning would help show how this might help your walk in the with the Lord, knowing the fact that there is a time of tears, but there is also a time of joy. That the fact is, is that there are things that are lost, but then there are some things that are recovered, and other things there are lost, and we never get them back. And like we can go into detail on that in another day as to why today is different than the day of Pentecost. There are some things that were lost from Pentecost that we'll never have back, and we will see again in glory. But in the meantime, we are thankful that the Lord has shown us and given us a measure of these truths back to us. So with that, I look forward to uh, seeing you on the next side of the Lord. So Terry's and and uh, get your list of questions ready to ask Ezra someday in glory. Wouldn't that be nice? And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next uh, podcast. If you have any questions, always jump over to commonthoughtsofchrist.com, commonthoughtsofchrist.com. You can leave me a message over there. Again, Mark Rogers signing off. And May we have the the cry that uh, John the Revelator has at the end of Revelation, even so come, Lord Jesus, and take your waiting people home. And so with that, we'll see you later.